Hello, welcome to my channel. My name is Ksenia. I am a gardener, artist, and book lover. Today I will be talking about two amazing magazines for book lovers. I was never really much of a magazine person. I always found them a bit frivolous and too many ads and all these glaring pictures and I just they just didn't really resonate with me. But when I discovered these two magazines, especially the first one, I was like, huh, I understand why people read magazines. Or at least the appeal of short articles on a subject. A subject that for me is very dear to my heart as a book lover, and that is reading. So the first magazine is O Reader. It's very new as in it has only has eight issues and this is the first one that i found in the barnes and nobles in new york city <laughs> the first article that i read just resonated so deeply with me that i'll have to read you a quote the title of the article is the bibliophile books are gentle companions generally and it starts by saying I was only just about murdered by books on one occasion, and that was 20 years ago. I wasn't sure what to do with my life. I had no prospects. I had an arts degree. I can relate. I started reading a fair bit, more than usual. I read for 10 to 12 hours a day. I'm not sure if I was deeply depressed or just really loved short stories. When I ran out of shelf space, I filled my closet with books, my dresser, my bed. You can fit about 100 books in an upright piano. One bookcase in particular, the Big Oak one, I called it the Big Oak, was so overloaded with books that it swayed gently back and forth all day and night like a drunken professor of English literature. My mother said this three times a week at least. That Big Oak bookcase is going to tip over one of these days and break every bone in your body, even your metacarpals. My mother was a school teacher. I just shrugged and keep reading and reading. I read for three years. Every book I read, I bought 10, a sound geometric plan. Things didn't really get out of hand until books started colonizing other rooms of the house, crawl spaces, a dormant fireplace. You can fit about 50 books in a dormant fireplace. Soon the halls were pine high like catacombs. <laughs> and it goes on to talk about how the bookcase did collapse on her and she was a bit hurt, but how she became a writer and and now, in her little blurb at the end, it says that her fiction, poetry, essays, and drawings are staples of the New York Times, the Saturday Evening Post, and other top outlets. And one of her short stories is actually being developed into a feature film. So these three hours, three years, paid off. <laughs> but there are just like almost every article is so good. It talks about there's like one science article in the first issue that I read about subvocalization and how reading at our own pace and articulating the words actually like develops our vocal cords too and how we should read at our own pace and not rush that process instead of speed reading which you come across probably a lot on YouTube and other places like how to maximize your reading count or whatever. Like every article is so good. And, oh, there's one called In Search of Helen Half, The Decline of Charing Cross Road. And about um, the unfortunate decline of bookshop streets and how independent bookstores are getting lost, I guess you could say. But, um, yeah, and then there's about chapbooks and the handmade book. For those of you who love handmade books or zines, it talks about the craft of it and the beauty of it. And that's just one issue. I read it from cover to cover. <laughs> and then I went back actually, I couldn't wait for the next issue to come out. So I went back and got the two issues before that. And oh, the articles are so well cho chosen. The editor is very, very good at choosing high quality writing and a very thoughtful combination of serious articles, more lighthearted ones. There is a little like short 
Instagram likes recommendations list and of course there's a little bit of ads but you know magazines must make some money that way I actually ended up annotating some of these articles because I thought they were so well written and thought provoking and this one that I annotated it is called depression steals the reading slump red flag Sometimes my reading slump is not a, but a low, a warning sign that my depression is back in full force. Every time it feels like a slap in the face. Every time I have to find my way back to my books without reading. Colleen talks about how, she, you know, she stops reading and how that's because this reading downturn is more than your typical slump. It's not interest or excitement or character that I'm lacking. This slump is all about fear. I am afraid of feeling. And when I realize that I'm afraid of feeling, I know that I am depressed. Fuck. I had ver various red flags over the years that alert me to my depression, but none hurt as much as a reading slump. When I realize that I'm avoiding reading and therefore avoid feeling, fear sets in. Because if I am to read again, I have to acknowledge the void I'm in. One of the many wonderful things about books is the safety they bring. Sanctuary where you can explore new ideas, experience emotions secondhand, and feel seen, understood, and not alone. Reading was my savior during bouts of anxiety long before I knew I had it. Showing me how to be brave, teaching me what is rational or absurd, and validating my heart when it hurts. Yeah, and it's a very, very good article about depression and how books can be a healing force but also sometimes we avoid reading because we know that it's gonna reflect something back to us about ourselves and make us feel and sometimes in a depressive state you kind of want to just numb out and not feel anything and books don't let you do that so i thought it was good and personally i know that i'm the reader who reads a lot of light books when I'm depressed. So I don't have that much of a numb out. For me, it's more of an anxiety that kind of freezes me up so I can't read harder things and I can't really do harder things in my life, like really challenging things. But everyone's different, and the, these articles explore that very well. All our different weird habits of reading and different ideas inspired by reading. There's an article on somebody who decided to cook all the things mentioned in a book, or <laughs> an article on annotating and how obsessive they got about <laughs> annotating every good sentence, every good idea, or oh, they can do better here. Oh, and there's this really beautiful article on the power of stories. It's called Mother's Search for Truth in the Library. When her son was diagnosed with a serious mental illness, Erica Goss turned to her most trusted friends, the books she checked out from the public library. And I really loved the last paragraphs. I still visit sections 616 and 362 and still check out books whose titles do not inspire hope. A Lethal Inheritance, When Madness Comes Home, Madhouse. Subtitles include A Memoir of Madness, My Time with Madness, When I Was Insane, and versions of When My Son, Brother, Daughter, Mother Was Insane, and What I Did or Didn't Do About It. As daunting as these titles are, they taught me that m the most important things we have are our stories and that writing them down so that someone else can find them is an act of both courage and compassion. I thank each one of these writers for these gifts, for taking the time to write about pain, about their pain, and for the effort it took to get their books published. They could not have known how much it would mean to me, a mother desperate for answers, to find their books on a dusty library shelf nor that their books would become my shields against the strange and often hostile world of mental illness. I thought that was so beautiful and it really made me kind of want to even just say and put this out there that 
every book has somebody who would really benefit from it. So if you're an author, if you write stories, if you write poems, share them, try to get them published, even online, even for free, share your stories. You never know who that the one person who will just resonate so strongly and have their whole lives touched by that story. A lot of the books I read are actually very niche. And sometimes like I had basically that idea that she formulates here that I'm just so grateful that these people took the time to write down their pain, write down their sadness and grief and reflect on it in a way that helps me process my own sadness, my own pain, my own grief, my own joy. Like it helps me find joy in the small things that aren't probably like, you know, New York Times best selling ideas, but in the day to day life, they really, really touched me. Yeah, just so many articles. Like there's like one out of 10 articles, maybe I'm just like, eh, I didn't care for it. But the other ones are amazing. So check out this magazine, support this amazing community of readers. And they're very small niche magazines. Yeah. So the second magazine that I wanted to talk about is Bookmarks. It's actually much older. This is like issue 100 and something. 119. So it's been around quite a while. <laughs> and I love this little cartoon. I want a moderately exciting thriller that allows me to sleep before 11 p.m. <laughs> That's so specific. But honestly, some of the recommendations in this, it's kind of like an Instagram page for books, but of course the writing is good and there's a lot of themes like there's a page for the international booker prize i still have to get around to doing the tomb of sand review but it was amazing and i wish i had discovered it earlier actually so if i had gotten this magazine i would have discovered these different um prizes earlier and there's also like by you know international place there's what's new in asia and it has Earthlings by Siaka Murata, which I loved. And it has a couple other ones, actually, which I will probably read. But they're short. I'm not sure I want, like, a hundred recommendations <laughs> to read from cover to cover. So I didn't like this magazine as much. But if you're not much of a screen time kind of person and don't like finding recommendations online I think this is a great way to cover a very large scope of books there's everything by literary fiction crime science fiction young adult general nonfiction biography history science and there's some larger or more in-depth pieces one on Ali Smith it's very good for those of us who are old-fashioned and like the pre-Instagram way of getting information in tidbits, but effectively and to the subject that you love, books. So if this sounds interesting to you, you can get it for like $7. And these are nine. But the quality of these is really good and they're also beautifully illustrated. So there's also like photography and it's just very, very well done. It's an artwork in and of itself. So yeah, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed that. And I'll probably at some point share my favorite like quotes and snippets from my next issues, <laughs> issues of this magazine, which I will definitely be following as long as it keeps running. And I hope it does. So Please go support it if this sounds interesting to you. <laughs> For my own sake. <laughs> Being so selfish here. But uh, anyways. Hope you're having a lovely week. And I will see you in my next episode. 
I'll be doing an episode on Poetry Monday soon and an episode on how I read, how I choose my next read. Is there any kind of system for that? And over the years, I have developed a little bit of a system that I will be sharing with you. Until next time, bye.